Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to this uh, uh, seminar series of the Center of Excellence for Energy. Um, Center of Excellence for Energy is um, a project funded by USAID and implemented by the Arizona State University in, in Egypt in collaboration with Ain Shams University, Mansoura University, and Aswan University. Uh, my name is Tamar Nedi. I'm a professor of mechanical engineering at Ain Shams University, and I'm uh, the technical advisor for the Center of Excellence project at the Arizona State University. Um, it is my pleasure today to welcome uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Professor uh, Kanan uh, to give us this uh, first version of the seminar. Um, and Dr. Kanan has, has earned his PhD degree from the Indian Institute of Science in Bangalore in 1990 with a focus on metal air batteries and alkaline fuel cells. Dr. Kanan is a professor in the Polytechnical School of the um, Era Fulton Schools of Engineering at Arizona State University, specializing in low temperature fuel cells. So it will be our pleasure today to uh, hear um, uh, from Dr. Kanan about uh, if uh, H2 economy realistic or not. So please, Dr. Kanan, you have the floor and we are all uh, looking forward to this uh, talk. Thank you, Professor uh, Temer. Can you all hear me? Yes. Okay. So this is going to be more like a interactive session. So feel free to stop me at any point of time uh, if you have any questions. So you don't have to wait until the end. So it will be about uh, 50 minutes uh, duration, but you know we can always go a little slow. I'm sure everybody can understand the English, right? So when we talk about uh, hydrogen economy, uh, so we use uh, hydrogen as an energy carrier in uh, every part of uh, applications, including stationary, transportation, industrial, uh, residential, and also commercial sectors. So obviously the hydrogen is the only fuel which is very, very simple compared to any other fuel. So, but you know, if you look at the periodic table, this is the first element. So it's, it's a well-known element, but uh, you know, unfortunately the hydrogen does not uh, occur as a separate gas. So, because the hydrogen is, even though hydrogen is abundant in the air, unfortunately it's always uh, available as a part of uh, other compounds. So such as with water, because it's reactive. So, you know, the simplest uh, molecule or simplest compound would be the water. But at the same time, if we can separate the hydrogen from uh, water, for example, then the hydrogen can be used in any application to produce energy or produce electrical power. So why do we talk about hydrogen? So obviously hydrogen, you know, if you look at the hydrogen fuel cell, the concept was demonstrated in the year 1839. So it's a long time ago that the hydrogen uh, was demonstrated uh, to produce electrical power, but still the hydrogen uh, based uh, devices are not commercially viable. So there are some reasons. So that's exactly what we are going to see. But uh, the motivation for looking at hydrogen as a major energy career is mainly because of the fact that hydrogen can be used in fuel cell to produce electrical power or it could be used in combustion engine or any kind of a reciprocate engine to produce power with the zero emission of nitrogen oxides or uh, carbon oxide. So, you know, without any pollutants. And certainly hydrogen, as we already saw, hydrogen can be used in all the sectors of the economy, whether it is a transportation or power generation or any kind of industrial applications or in residential or the commercial buildings. So 
So this is the reason why we look at hydrogen as an energy carrier. So let's look at the energy density comparison with uh, fuel, which uh, we normally use these days. So gasoline. So gasoline has energy density. You know, if you look at uh, black and red, so the black bars are whatever per liter. So energy content per unit volume. And the red ones are the energy contents per unit mass. So if you look at the values for um, gasoline, it is 9,000 watt-hour per liter and 13,500 watt-hour per kilogram. Now, if you look at uh, ethanol, it's not too bad. So 6,000 and also about 8,000 watt-hour per liter and also watt-hour per kilogram. Now, if you compare in the similar fashion about lithium-ion batteries, it's a 250 and 350 watt-hour per liter and watt-hour per kilogram. Now, if you look at the lead-acid batteries, those values are extremely low, 40 and 25. Now, if you look at uh, the hydrogen. So if you look at the hydrogen based on the volumetric energy density, which is extremely low because of the lower or lowest density of the gas. Okay, so it's only about three watt-hour per liter. Whereas if you look at the energy content per unit mass of hydrogen, it is about 40,000, which is almost three times compared to our standard gasoline fuel. So in other words, hydrogen has the highest gravimetric energy density among all the fuels or energy devices, which we know as of now. So this is again, as I said, this is the motivational factors for why we look at the hydrogen. Any question? Okay, I'm sure all are muted, so they may not ask questions now, but... Uh... So in the hydrogen economy, when we look at, you know, how we produce hydrogen, how we distribute, how we convert or how we store hydrogen and where the hydrogen can be utilized. So comprising all these, we call it as a hydrogen economy. So in other words, right now we have hydrocarbon economy. So gasoline or the, uh, any kind of a fuel, which is also containing carbon. So hydrocarbon. So hydrocarbon fuel is well known, but you know, only about 130 or 140 years old. Now throughout the world, every country has access to fuel, whether it is produced or you know, whether the fuel is uh, produced locally or imported from other uh, countries. Every country has a transportation which runs almost like a 99% of the transportation is on gasoline, petroleum products. Or you talk about uh, maybe energy generation or you know power generation stations. There are only about 220 nuclear power generation stations, which we call always as a cleaner power generation station, even though we may not call them as a renewable power generation station, but you know, cleaner. Other than that, uh, there are thousands of natural gas uh, powered uh, power generation stations and also coal fired power generation stations in addition to uh, hydrothermal or hydro or hydel power generation stations. So in the hydrogen economy, we, we have to produce hydrogen, but we store it, distribute it, and convert to hydrogen in a cleaner manner to produce power, which could be directly used in the transportation sectors, which is supposed to generate almost like a 70% of the uh, carbon dioxide or uh, mostly the so-called uh, dirty fuel, right? So CO2 is a major greenhouse gas. 
So hydrogen economy is going to see the first application in the transportation sector. In fact, there's, uh, there are trains which run only on hydrogen, multiple ones in Europe, and also there's one recently introduced in Canada. I see a chat window. see the chat message but anyway so so this is all uh, the hydrogen economy is about but as i said you know hydrogen production is the first one so when we talk about uh, economy hydrogen production can be from natural gas which uh, we see there's a lot compared to gasoline fuel or you can also produce hydrogen from coal in addition we can produce hydrogen from nuclear power generated systems and also renewable sources. Once we produce hydrogen, the hydrogen can be utilized in fuel cells or can be used in internal combustion engines or ice engines or gas turbines, or you can also use them as a energy storage systems. In addition, we can also use the hydrogen or we have been using hydrogen in the petrochemical industry for uh, refining. We can use that to, to produce uh, methanol. We can also use them or we have been using in the electronics industry. We can use uh, hydrogen for producing ammonia or you know, steel making. Hydrogen is also being used for uh, reduction, food processing, and also in the cosmetic industry. So in other words, if we do not have hydrocarbon fuel, petroleum products, we can still manage the entire economy or the entire industry with uh, only hydrogen fuel. Yes, we can leave the questions uh, until the end. Thank so you. let's look at uh, the major types of hydrogen. So the hydrogen can be called as a gray hydrogen or blue hydrogen. In the next slide, we will see what the green hydrogen is. So gray hydrogen is the one which we produce from natural gas reformation or steam methane reforming. So natural gas has more than 90% methane. So steam methane reforming would give you hydrogen, but unfortunately would also give you carbon dioxide. So that's a gray hydrogen, meaning you also produce carbon dioxide when you produce hydrogen. At the same time, if you can capture carbon dioxide emission, then the hydrogen can be called as a blue hydrogen, even though the feedstock is the natural gas or methane. So once we capture carbon dioxide, it can be used for any other industrial applications or the carbon dioxide can be even electrochemically reduced to produce fuel for additional applications. So obviously blue hydrogen is one of the ways, especially for decarbonizing the entire world. In addition, you know, if you talk about natural gas or steam methane reforming with the carbon dioxide capturing, we can also produce blue hydrogen from biomass. When you use the biomass as a feedstock, you don't end up producing too much of carbon dioxide. So the hydrogen produced from steam uh, biomass can be labeled as a blue hydrogen. But in, suddenly the green hydrogen is the most attractive form of hydrogen where the power comes from the renewable sector or you know when we produce electrical power from solar photovoltaics or wind turbines so you produce that electrical power to split water in an electrolyzer when we do that, there is no carbon footprint through the process. So everything is non-carbon or everything is entirely green. So in fact, there are 
hundreds of projects around the world to produce green hydrogen. In fact, uh, about a couple of weeks ago, in the Middle East, it's a Bahrain country, where the goal is to invest $200 billion. I think it's the Sul uh, Sultanate of Oman. So they said uh, over the period of next seven years, by end of 2030, they want to invest 200 billion US dollars to have electrical power produced from renewable means to power electrolyzer for producing green hydrogen. And also Morocco. Morocco wants to be number one in hydrogen production. And in the South American continent or country, Colombia wants to produce hydrogen by investing heavily on the renewable energy sector. So within the next 10 years, the scenario is going to be entirely different for producing hydrogen in a large scale for probably finding kind of a replacement for the gasoline-based uh, sector all in the industry and also transportation. So here you can see production methods like a gray hydrogen, where we use a fossil fuel, which is a natural gas or steam, uh, natural gas or uh, methane are greener. So you produce electrical power from a renewable energy source and split water to produce hydrogen are blue. So these gray, green, and blue GGB is one of the well-known ways to produce a hydrogen. But now there are too many different uh, type of hydrogen. So it's almost like a rainbow or even the colors are also expanding based on what the source material is for producing hydrogen. So it could be green or white or gold, brown, black, gray, turquoise, blue, purple, pink, and red. It all depends on where the feedstock is coming from. Okay, so there are too many things. I'm sure these slides can be shared with all the participants, so you don't have to worry about reading it because there are too many details. So these methods, hydrogen production methods are shown here right now or maybe in the next uh, five to seven years. Okay, so the ones you see in blue are the centralized hydrogen production methods. So centralized hydrogen production methods are typically in relatively larger scale, say 50,000 kilograms per day or 100,000 or more than half a million kilogram per day production. So depending on the scale, okay, so that can be termed as a centralized hydrogen production. If you produce a hydrogen in, this, in a centralized locations, then the hydrogen can be distributed through pipelines to the place of application or place of use. Whereas the distributed hydrogen production, which are typically lower in volume or weight, so say, for example, about 1,500 kilogram or 1,500 kilogram per day. So now you look at uh, different methods. So for example, if you look at the distributed hydrogen production where you have I mean, you know, a larger campus or a larger community, uh, a neighborhood where the hydrogen production system can be installed. So it could be powered by wind turbines or biomass or grid pathways or solar energy. So even natural gas reforming with the solar, I mean, with the carbon dioxide capturing, or electrolysis, or bio-derived liquids, or microbial biomass conversion. All are relatively smaller, so that can be used for distributed hydrogen production. So this is going to go further. Now, if you look at, uh, say, in the past, for example, in the past two, five to seven, eight years, majority of the hydrogen was from natural gas reforming or steam methane reforming. 
But after 20, so you can also see slightly smaller scale with the biomass gasification. So that one is more uh, greener and it's a uh, true hydrogen. So now you look at, uh, say, towards uh, 2025 or in the next uh, few years, electrolysis and wind turbine powered uh, hydrogen production electroly electrolysis systems are also in the making. Now, beyond 2025, you can see that coal gasification with the carbon capturing and the sequestration, electrolysis, high temperature electrolysis, photoelectrochemical hydrogen production. So this is very attractive method for producing hydrogen without involving any kind of a carbon footprint. And also STCH, which is a solar thermal, thermochemical hydrogen production and also photobiological. So with the time, most of the hydrogen is going to be generated or, or produced by more renewable means, meaning it will be more greener hydrogen. So it will become commercial maybe in the uh, next 15 to 20 years. So in terms of minimizing the carbon footprint through the process. So that's what we call it as a greener hydrogen. So in the next couple of slides, I'm going to talk about, uh, it's more on the science which we actually conduct our research in my lab for producing hydrogen by photoelectrochemical water splitting. So as uh, you may or may not understand, so we, we always uh, calculate or measure the current density and based on the current density, using the Faraday's electrolysis uh, or electrolysis law, we calculate the amount of hydrogen production. So we can actually produce uh, or we can get up to more than 6 milliamp per centimeter square. So that would translate to probably like, you know, a liter per square meter area of the electrode. So we, we work on the, or uh, we design the electrode materials, we design the electrode structure, we design the device, we also develop up to a pilot demonstration. So we do a little bit of fundamental research, but we always focus on the applied research in our school. So our goal is always to develop a pilot level uh, device and demonstrate for producing hydrogen. The recent past, this was actually, this is not even published yet. So our uh, manuscript is in uh, review in the International Journal of Hydrogen Energy, where uh, the, the electrode was a titanium nanotube decorated photo anode. So we could actually grow titanium nanotubes for making photo electrochemical device for producing hydrogen. This is actually based on the device. So as I said, based on the current density, we can always calculate the hydrogen production rate in the photo electrochemical water splitting device for producing hydrogen. So, you know, this slide is very important uh, based on, you know, whether uh, we produce a hydrogen by photo fermentation or wind power, powered electrolysis or photo electrolysis, solar PV electrolysis or bio photolysis, steam methane reforming with uh, carbon capturing and sequestration or coal gasification with uh, carbon capture and sequestration, solar thermal based water electrolysis, or proton, that's a PEM, so proton exchange membrane based electrolysis, or steam methane reforming without carbon capture and sequestration. These values on the y axis gives you the kilogram of carbon dioxide when you produce one kilogram of hydrogen. So, in other words, if you look at the carbon without carbon capture and sequestration, we actually end up producing more than 13 kilogram of CO2 when we produce one kilogram of hydrogen. So that's the reason why we al always need to do uh, steam methane reforming with the carbon capture and the sequestration where the CO2 emission can be less than six kilogram per uh, kilogram of hydrogen production. So our goal 
is always to reduce the carbon footprint. So that's the reason we need to be on the left end of this spectrum so that we end up producing lowest amount of carbon dioxide when we produce a unit mass of hydrogen gas. So we can actually consolidate the hydrogen production method. So in the mid, uh, mid term, our goal is always to have a large scale commercialization of the electrolyzer. But in the long term, it will be mostly power for the electrolyzer coming from the renewable means. Meaning in the mid term, you can always use the, uh, use the power produced from maybe coal powered power station or maybe nuclear powered station or maybe uh, natural gas generated power to, produce, uh, to power the electrolyzer or maybe water or hydel station. But in the long term, the goal is to use the power generated from renewable resources to power the electrolyzer for producing hydrogen. So that's the goal. But at the same time, you know, in many countries, especially in US, Canada, and Europe, uh, the goal is always to have this greener hydrogen production methods becoming commercially viable, maybe in the long term. When we say long term, it would be in the next uh, 10 to 15 years. So next uh, step is to look at the hydrogen storage methods. So the hydrogen storage methods can be physical or material level storage. In the physical method, we, once you produce hydrogen, you compress hydrogen or you make it into liquid form. In the material storage, you use the hydrogen to form some compound. So you form metal hydrides or you can produce a liquid organic hydrogen with some compounds like a cycloalkanes, n heterocyclanes or formic acid. So LOC or LOH. So depending on which is more commercially viable, we can always move forward with the storage methods. So depending on the storage methods, Next step is to transport the hydrogen. So, especially when the hydrogen is being produced in large scale, we need to transport the hydrogen. So it could be, as we saw in the previous slide, it could be stored in solid form, liquid form, or in the compressed form. So in the solid form, it's a metal hydride, so there's no pressure, it's very safe, but you, know, you can't store a, a huge amount of hydrogen. But in liquid form, you can store you know, a larger quantity of hydrogen, but unfortunately, we need to go to minus 253 degrees Celsius. In the compressed form, you can actually go to 700 bars. So 700 bar is almost like a 10,000 PSI pressure. And there are cylinders which can accommodate a high pressure. And uh, based on the storage method, you can transport by road, or through pipeline or by ocean that can go to the delivery site. So with a little more details, as we see here in this slide, when we transport through road, it could be by tube trailers. So larger containers or metal hydride or even liquid hydrogen. So road transportation. In the pipeline, it could be, say, liquid hydrogen or also, you know, uh, compressed gas or, you know, in uh, gaseous form. Through ocean, it could be the liquid organic hydrogen compounds or just the liquefied hydrogen, depending on which is available. That can go to the delivery site and then you can convert it to pure hydrogen before you distribute. So you may be wondering why, especially when we transport hydrogen in solid form, which is very safe, one of the requirement is always to transport the larger quantity of hydrogen. So metal hydride is very attractive. But unfortunately, the metal hydride is not sufficient 
in terms of energy content or a kilogram of hydrogen per unit mass of metal hydride for transportation applications. So there are ultimate uh, targets published by the US Department of Energy in terms of uh, kilogram of hydrogen per kilogram of metal hydride for gravimetric or volumetric or system cost all the way to the vehicle refueling within four to five minutes. So again, still co several companies are looking at the possibility to store hydrogen in solid form using metal hydride. Even though these are not commercially viable as of now, but I think there are still potential. The reason is that if this is the most safest way for storing hydrogen, and then you can transport in solid hydrogen form. So this is uh, more crowded. So we actually made this uh, uh, kind of uh, more complicated figure for our uh, recent publication on the hydrogen economy. So the goal is to talk about uh, hydrogen storage, transportation, and how we distribute. So as you see here, once we produce uh, hydrogen, we store it in liquid form or gaseous form or in liquid form. Once uh, we store them in liquid, uh, so for example, here in liquid form, here in high, high pressure uh, storage container or in the salt cavern, gaseous form. So high pressure container or uh, salt cavern or liquid hydrogen, you transport uh, through road or pipeline, and then you know you can actually distribute with a lower pressure to ultimate uh, uh, usage device, which could be in the transportation sector. It could be uh, individual uh, or uh, transportation vehicles, including passenger cars. So, especially this technology is now developed. So you have values shown in blue and also red. So the red values are the targets and the blue ones are almost like an eight years old status. Now the values are slightly better. So this was also developed by us, especially for the you know, high pressure to low pressure. So especially for various applications, especially for refueling the transportation sector based vehicles, whether it's a forklift, are a larger truck, hydrogen fuel cell based trucks, or hydrogen buses, or you know, especially high pressure uh, refueling capability based uh, vehicles, where you can see almost a 700 bar, so 10,000 psi based refueling systems. So here I just wanted to show you whether uh, the liquid hydrogen is being used in the commercial sector for transporting between the countries or between the continents. So there are few Australian companies which produce hydrogen and that's being liquefied and from the port in the uh, southeast part of the country, which is shipped in liquid hydrogen through ship to Japan. So Japan actually buys a liquid hydrogen from Australia. Once the liquid hydrogen arrives here, then liquid hydrogen can be easily converted to gaseous form for various applications, including that for automotive applications. So there are thousands of hydrogen-based passenger vehicles in operation in Japan. And in the US, there are about 2,500 passenger cars, uh, which are being mostly uh, used in California. So here, it's mostly the cost for shipping hydrogen by various modes. So if the hydrogen shipment is only about 5,000 kilometers, you can see that the one at the bottom, which is ammonia via ship. If it's a hydrogen pipeline for a shorter distance, it's too expensive. Whereas this is actually a long distance, but if it's a shorter distance, say up to only 500 kilometers, the best option would be pipeline. 
So shorter distance pipeline, longer distance, it is mainly with the other compounds, say ammonia via ship, and then you convert it to hydrogen. So next step in the hydrogen economy is the utilization. So mainly for powering the entire global energy systems. As you see at the left end, uh, these are all the sort of application. And uh, when you see hydrogen available, it is, you know, once we produce hydrogen and uh, because that's what we saw in the uh, slides until now, once we have that, we have application areas which could be industrial or mainly for producing electrical power through fuel cells or through compression. In the compression sector, you can use uh, internal combustion engine or gas turbines or thermal energy production, including that for home cooking. So hydrogen can be used for home cooking instead of a natural gas. In the fuel cell-based hydrogen applications, it can be in the mobility sector or stationary power generation or even transportation through mobility. In the industrial sector, oil refining, ammonia production, methanol production, chemical productions, and also steel making and also other metallurgical applications. But uh, this is not going to be easy because there are cheaper fuel available. So as of now, hydrogen is available for more than $15 per kilogram, whereas the equivalent energy content-based gasoline is only less than $5 or $6. So in other words, we certainly need to do the SWOT analysis, which is the strength, weakness, and opportunity and threat. And also the market potentials have to be properly assessed and every country has to look at the policy aspects. Once these are done, we will suddenly move towards a hydrogen society. We call ourselves as a hydrogen society once the hydrogen economy has become commercially viable. And that is not going to be difficult because every sector, there are several application areas which are being exploited, including that for kind of a fuel cell. So fuel cell sector, has become really attractive and fuel cells are now becoming commercially viable. If you are new to fuel cell, this slide shows you the operating principle of proton exchange membrane fuel cell where hydrogen comes in the anode, H2. In the presence of catalyst, hydrogen splits into proton and the electrons. The electrons pass in the external circuit and the protons pass through the electrolyte to the cathode where you have oxygen from atmospheric air. The oxygen combines with the proton which is coming from the anode and also along with the electron to produce water. So when the hydrogen is being used in the fuel cell, we produce water and electricity. So water is the only product in addition to electrical power. This electrical power can be used in various applications, including electric cars. So this is a typical configuration of an electric car. So it could be from the Toyota Mirai where you have the fuel cell stack. There's also a battery for starting the vehicle or accelerating the electric car. So smaller battery, so major drive train or a major power comes from the fuel cell stack. So that's an electric motor, which does not make too much of noise and absolutely no carbon footprint, no smoke. So oxygen is needed, which can be from the atmospheric air, oxygen and hydrogen fuel to produce power, which can operate the electric motor or also can recharge the smaller battery 
in the electric car. So hydrogen is filled in the container or a tank. And suddenly water is the only product. So no tailpipe, so no smoke. Here, this is actually the latest generation of the hydrogen fuel cell car, which is actually available for sale in California in the US. So it's called Mirai, which means future in Japanese language. And in fact, uh, last year, Toyota demonstrated the vehicle with one tank of hydrogen to drive 845 miles. That sort of a record demonstrated by the company last year. In other words, range is not a problem at all with the hydrogen fuel cell car. And also, these cars can be refueled within five minutes with a total weight of five, kilo, five kilogram of hydrogen. So it is not uh, that hydrogen can only be used in the smaller vehicles. As you see here, this is a larger truck. So this is only the cockpit of the larger truck where the fuel cell and the hydrogen tanks are located. Hydrogen is about 33 kilogram and the fuel cell stack is about 200 kilowatt to two units and the electric motor, which is 350 kilowatt. So this can haul, this can pull any kind of a load. Okay. So this is one of the models which is available for Hyundai Motors in South Korea. In addition, they have been manufacturing electric truck of this dimension, and they have been selling in hundreds. And this was actually a photograph which was released uh, last year, beginning of last year by Hyundai, when they delivered this electric truck, fuel cell powered hydrogen powered truck in Switzerland. And in fact, these vehicles are also available, are also being used in Southern California in the port. So pure electric powered with the hydrogen fuel cell power. And uh, you may or may not know, there's a company called Nikola Fuel Cell Truck. These trucks are powered only by fuel cells. And the company is actually located not far away from Arizona State University. We in fact also have a fuel cell project in our lab. So we conduct our research on batteries and fuel cells mainly for automotive applications. So these fuel cell powered uh, trucks can be driven for more than 500 plus miles per tank of hydrogen. And in fact, the company also calculated the total cost of ownership or TCO. And they claim that the vehicle can be driven over a period of seven years up to 700,000 miles before the fuel cell is being replaced. And the TCO or the total cost of ownership could be as low as 0.95 mile per, $95 per mile. Whereas I think this is almost much better compared to gasoline. The important aspect is, you know, the cost could be almost closer or uh, lower, but at the same time, the whole, aspect is without any carbon footprint. That's the biggest thing. So in addition to the transportation sector, residential applications are also being demonstrated, are in fact available as a hybrid system with a photovoltaic or solar photovoltaic based power generation. Then you have a regulator or DC-DC control. You have a battery system to operate the fuel cell at any point of time. You have a electrolyzer. Water is being you know, uh, filled in the electrolyzer system and you produce hydrogen. Hydrogen is being allowed to power the fuel cell. Then you have a DC to AC inverter. Then you can have any kind of electric motor to 
or electric load or motor depending on the applications. And in fact, the World Hydrogen Association headquarters is actually in Phoenix. And there's also a home close to Phoenix area where the entire home is powered by this so-called hybrid residential system. So as I said, the hydrogen can also be used directly in the internal combustion engine, whether it is you know, with a liquid injection, liquid hydrogen injection system or a direct, direct uh, injector with the internal combustion engine or maybe high pressure boosted internal combustion engine or hybrid system. So with a slight modification of the internal combustion engine, hydrogen can also be used. In fact, in the past, California governor, Arnold Schwarzenegger, well-known Hollywood actor, he was actually using hydrogen as fuel in his modified Hummer for several years. So hydrogen can be directly used in the internal combustion as well. But again, this is burning, so conversion would be less efficient compared to the hydrogen fuel cell electricity generation systems. There have been many, or there are still applications uh, with the ship using fuel cell to power. So there were like a Miranda with a 165 kilowatt proton exchange membrane fuel cell system powered by hydrogen, or up to even 400 kilowatt proton exchange membrane fuel cell systems, and also 600 kilowatt pump fuel cell. And that project is still going on. And there were also other projects in Europe called High Dime and also High Seas 3. So whether it is for uh, transportation systems on the road or off the road in ocean, you can use hydrogen and the fuel cells. So as I mentioned, the hydrogen can also be used for generating heat. In particular, if you look at the energy content per unit mass of hydrogen, it is three times compared to natural gas. So as you see here in A, this is a natural gas. This is a hybrid. And the one you see at the right hand side is the pure hydrogen. So thermal energy content is three times compared to natural gas. So we do not have carbon footprint. So this is the best fuel for using in the kitchen. So here again, you know, we, we actually made this figure with too many information combining current, mid-term and long-term hydrogen economy on the Y scale. And if you look at the X axis or the X direction, production systems, delivery and the distribution, application areas and also barriers. So now if you look at the left bottom, gray hydrogen. As we already know, producing hydrogen by natural gas, large scale. That's current. That is going to slowly transition to blue hydrogen where you may probably capture CO2 and then put them in the pipeline. In the midterm, you will be generating more blue hydrogen. It could be biomass, mostly, maybe small scale natural gas or fossil fuel based source or a feedstock with a CO2 footprint. And you can put the CO2 maybe in the salt cavern. So there are multiple salt caverns in Europe. In fact, before the pandemic, I visited Romania closer to Budapest, uh, no, no, uh, uh, Bucharest, where there's an underground cavern, huge underground cavern where you can actually store carbon dioxide for long term, or you can also store hydrogen as a storage medium. So, underground salt caverns are 
also proposed as a storage medium. If you use the methane or natural gas based feedstock to produce hydrogen, you can capture CO2 and then put them in the underground cavern, salt cavern. Or if you produce a large scale blue hydrogen or green hydrogen, you can also use that as a storage medium, as you see here. Okay. Long term, as we already know, the goal is to produce green hydrogen from renewable powered sources. Now, if you look at the distribution in the current scenario, cube trailers, and then you know go all the way to the refueling locations or dispensing stations. But in the little long term or mid term, you have hydrogen and then you can just fill it. Or in the long term, you already have the hydrogen system, hydrogen pipeline system, all the way to the usage locations, application areas. It could be a smaller passenger car or a bus or a truck or a trailer or a passenger train systems or maybe you know a ocean trans transport system or industrial applications of hydrogen, whether it's a steel making or maybe urea. Um, CH3OCH3 and also methanol. In the other sectors like you know power generation or micro combined heat and power and also thermal energy production. So all these application areas can be commercially viable with the hydrogen. So in other words, hydrogen is going to be feasible. All those elements are being looked at in a detailed manner. But the barriers are again not very difficult, but you know, we need to look at them carefully. That's because of the higher cost of hydrogen, lack of hydrogen distribution network. Again, fuel cell systems are currently more expensive, but you know, the price is being, you know, price is coming down year by year. And uh, the government incentives are slightly lower, are still lower for low carbon. Uh, sectors or there is no carbon penalty by many companies or many countries. So if there is a carbon penalty, then many application sector would start using hydrogen as a feedstock or lack of government policies as of now. In fact, uh, in the COP27 held in Egypt, so in Cairo last year, uh, it was in November, there was a major focus on utilizing hydrogen as a major uh, feedstock for various applications. So many countries are actually putting a lot of uh, resources for producing hydrogen to make hydrogen economy commercially viable. So other barriers are, again, you know, transportation sector for hydrogen is uh, kind of uh, more expensive. And again, you know, if you have to have a large scale hydrogen production systems, so maybe land acquisition or, uh, you know, putting infrastructure is also a little bit uh, uh, harder as of now. But again, you know, based on what's happening now, this is the roadmap or hydrogen roadmap in the United States. You can see the red ones, which are yearly commercialization levels and the blue ones are now commercially available and that scenario keeps changing with the time. So by 2025, you can see too many sector is going to become blue, which is mature market by using hydrogen. By 2030 and beyond, all the transportation, I mean, whether it's a rail or a road, are uh, all the you know uh, air sectors everything is going to become hydrogen based so when i talk about uh, you know using hydrogen in the air sector or air transportation the many companies coming in into arizona area in phoenix there's a company called the zero avia which is actually investing multi billion dollar for producing hydrogen by electrolysis 
right at the airport so that they can start the refueling planes which would use the fuel cell for powering. It's centralized power production systems and also other industrial heat generation instead of oil you can actually use hydrogen. So US Department of Energy has invested $150 million last month through ASU to establish an energy institute in the Arizona State University to look at the pollution in the industrial sector, where the goal is to actually replace the oil by hydrogen or less carbon producing fuel stock. So when we talk about all these issues, it is certainly going to be possible only when in a decade, one kilogram of hydrogen cost becomes $1, or we call it triple one, $1 per kilogram of hydrogen in one decade. That's again, green hydrogen. This is the goal established by the US Department of Energy. And certainly many, as I said, many uh, countries are in the race to capture this uh, hydrogen economy, where instead of uh, oil, which are you know, being controlled by the o OPEC countries, now every country can become energy secured by producing hydrogen by electrolysis, which is electrolyzers powered by cleaner or renewable energy sources. So the decision is always ours, whether we still need to have a dirty power generation station or we adopt distributed energy generation station with the solar PV, wind turbine to produce hydrogen and use that hydrogen to power our daily need. Because, you know, they, these numbers are mind boggling. So that's the reason I had given this number. So we made a little cartoon to demonstrate how much carbon dioxide we produce when we have a internal combustion engine compared to zero emission vehicle. So each car will produce per year for I know close to five metric tons each car per year. In the world, we have about two billion number of passenger cars as of now. So two billion and two billion times five metric tons. So you can calculate the amount of carbon dioxide emission per year. Whereas when, once you have the electricity, which is greener or renewable, and then we use the electric car to get recharged, we do not produce carbon footprint. So for example, you know, I have been driving electric car, which uh, I drive from uh, my home, and my home also has on the roof, I have a larger solar PV system. So when our home uses air conditioning system, 90% of the power comes from my home solar PV system. And when I recharge my electric car, I always mostly use during the daytime in the weekend to recharge. So the power also comes from the solar PV systems on the roof. So the goal is always to you know, expand from where we are. So Arizona State University has more than 70 megawatt of solar PV systems in the campus, which is probably the largest in the whole world in any educational institution. So university campuses are becoming more greener. And again, we also have educational programs on clean energy systems. So we in fact have master's MS in engineering, master of science in engineering 
on clean energy systems, which has courses on batteries, fuel cells, power electronics for battery management system or power management systems, autonomous electric vehicles. All these courses will comprise in the you know two years of program on the clean energy systems. So we have we are about 10 faculty in the clean energy systems and we try to focus on hydrogen and battery for cleaner or zero carbon footprint for cleaner world. So to summarize our uh, hydrogen economy feasibility, I would say electrolysis will be the major hydrogen production approach, but that could be complemented by the well-established steam methane reforming if that is needed. And the storage could be commercially viable compressed form as of now, and that's probably going to continue for a little longer. And transportation, as I said, compressed form so that uh, uh, compressed hydrogen could always be transported via road for distributing for the automotive or transportation sector. And the fuel cells could become the conversion system for producing electricity for the transportation and also uh, stationary applications. To me, I would say 50% is kind of feasible right now. And in the next five to 10 years, it's going to be commercially viable. So thank you very much for your uh, time. So I have been uh, working on batteries and fuel cells for almost 30 plus years and our applied research has always been on hydrogen and fuel cells with a major focus on the you know, a demonstration level with the, you know, pilot scale. Thank you very much. And uh, I can open it for any questions. Thank you, Dr. Kanan, for this interesting uh, presentation. It's very useful. And actually, a lot of our uh, attendees here asked for the presentation. Uh, I, get, I took their emails. I'm not sure if you will be able to share it with them. I will leave this to you. And yeah, I'm very sure I can. Yeah. All right. Sure. Are, there any, this is are there any questions in the chat window or how do yes, you want to? I have, a, I have a question here from Dr. Muhammad Saif. Okay. He says that uh, what is about offshore wind energy and electro cycle, I believe. And also he asked, uh, he commented that, uh, that due to the environmental issues, the battery industries will decay by the 2050 and vehicles would be pure hydrogen. So if you would like to comment on this. So yeah, that's a very good question actually. If you look at uh, say fuel cell powered or battery powered or fuel cell battery hybrid, battery's life is always limited. And in fact, the, the battery companies claim that the batteries will work for maybe 200,000 miles or maybe 17 years of life. But at the same time, the battery are not uh, required to be recycled after they come out of the electric cars because the batteries can be used for second life applications. So in other words, batteries will be an issue unless we capture them or collect them properly and recycle them in a very, very controlled or responsible manner. Because you know, ultimately batteries uh, also require critical elements like a cobalt, nickel, and manganese, and zinc, and all those metals. And those materials have to be carefully recycled for making newer batteries. And in terms of using offshore wind turbines, yeah, certainly as long as we can actually produce power by renewable means, whether it's onshore, offshore wind turbines, or solar PV, if you can use that to power to produce uh, hydrogen by electrolyzing or splitting water through electrolyzers, that is the most attractive way to minimize or to offset the carbon footprint. Yeah, this is great. Um, all right, I don't know if, uh, if there is any more questions. Uh, I have here around five. Let's see. Uh, 
here Dr. Yasser Mustafa is asking, are long carries, uh, carriers used to tra transfer H2 by ocean? If so, are there any changes needed to modify the long carriers to suit transferring H2? So yeah, that, that's again, you know, a very good point because the concept is kind of similar. But uh, for uh, liquid hydrogen uh, transportation across the countries or across the uh, continents, we have to keep the temperature uh, much, much lower. As I mentioned in one of the slides, the liquid nitrogen is at minus 253 degrees Celsius. So, so liquid uh, fuel transportation is common. So concept is well known. So you have to have a thermal insulation, but otherwise it is possible. Okay, great. Also, Dr. Mohammad Saif added, are there any research about the required water resources for green hydrogen? So the water needs to be cleaner, but you know, sometimes it could be, you know, seawater also. So one of, I think many, almost all countries have, uh, say, chlorine or chloralkyl industries for producing chlorine gas for pharmaceutical industry when the chlorine gas is produced for uh, pharmaceutical industry by alkalizing seawater, you also produce uh, sodium hydroxide and hydrogen in the cathode. Even the same hydrogen can be used for various applications. So in other words, water source or water resource is very critical, but at the same time, it is not an issue because we don't need, I mean, you know, too much volume of water. Okay, great. Uh, all right. Uh, is there any more questions? Uh, this is all I've got for now. Yeah, there is uh, Dr. Sharif Serafi uh, has raised his hand and he wants to ask a question. So I will give him the floor to ask. Dr. Sharif. Dr. Sharif, you are muted. Hello? Yes. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Dr. Cannon. I, hear, I have here some comments on, uh, on some of the slides that you have presented. Uh, first of all, concerning the combustion of the hydrogen. It's the worst way to combust it, uh, specifically in the domestic applications in the cooking uh, because of uh, the uh, emissions of the NOx. And this is being uh, raised by many of the, uh, uh, of the institutes uh, concerning the, uh, the emissions of the NOx and the, uh, what, what could cause. Uh, number two, uh, this is one point. The other point is concerning the blue hydrogen. Blue hydrogen, uh, whatever you can capture of the CO2, there is still emissions, some emissions in CO2, plus whatever is more serious is the methane emissions, which could cause uh, a green, it's the most uh, effective greenhouse gas and could cause uh, a lot of uh, problems with the uh, atmosphere. Uh, Meanwhile, uh, we, you have here uh, talked about using it uh, for, uh, uh, for air conditioning and uh, heating, but uh, I think that the heat pumps would be more efficient in this case. Uh, concerning the uh, private cars and the use of uh, fuel cells for the private cars, I think that it, was, it will be more economical for the heavy trucks for the long distance to use uh, a hydrogen uh, fuel cells. Uh, one more point uh, you didn't mention about Neom. Neom is one of the biggest uh, production uh, plants in the uh, uh, Saudi Arabia, and it will produce hydrogen for uh, exporting it in the form of green ammonia. Okay. So these are just points that I have um, raising. Uh, uh, it's uh, 
your presentation is perfect, but I, I will just add these points. If you have comments on this specifically for the NOx, as well as for the methane emissions. I, yeah, I think that th those are very important to consider, but yeah, maybe I did not pay attention to that uh, in my slides. But, uh, you know, as we already know, it, it's going to be a very slow transition. So the idea is, you know, we, we produce, I mean, you know, uh, still, I mean, you know, uh, sufficient amount of hydrogen from steam methane reforming for uh, various applications. But uh, with the time, you know, ultimately it has to be with the electrolyzer, right? So as you mentioned, I mean, you know, even when we transition to blue hydrogen, we may still produce some uh, uh, unwanted uh, or carbon footprint, but ultimately that has to change it to entirely green. Yeah, th thank you for adding those comments. Uh, okay. Anyway, uh, the emissions, whatever it is, whatever you capture here, you capture it with an efficiency of maximum 92%. And uh, the, the CO2 will be emitted in any way, plus yeah. the, uh, uh, the uh, methane emissions, which comes from the source. Whenever we are talking about emissions, it's not emissions from the SMR itself. It's emissions from the source, from the well. Whenever, whenever you calculate it, you calculate the emissions from the well, till the end user. Exactly. Yeah, we, we still need to do the LCA, right? So life cycle uh, analysis from the well to wheel or maybe for any other applications. Yeah, so those uh, numbers have to be incorporated. I, I had a slide, uh, uh, I'm sure you looked at uh, the, the CO2 emission for various methods to produce hydrogen for, you know, per kilogram. Still, I mean, no, even in the electrolyzer or even PEC, there's still kind of a smaller quantity of CO2 em emitted. Uh, last point is concerning the liquid hydrogen. You yeah. have presented the case of uh, the transmission of liquid hydrogen from Australia to Japan. Yes. Uh, by the way, the, the first trip of this ship catch it fire. And- uh, uh, I did not know that. <laughs> and, in, okay. and in the meantime, uh, it, there is a lot of losses during the trip because uh, when you have uh, liquid hydrogen at uh, minus 200, yeah, 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 uh, right, right. and there is a lot of uh, 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 losses loss. during the, the operation trip. loss. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, the, so that's I why think, you know, I think there was a question be, uh, on the. Uh, ship which uh, transport uh, liquefied natural gas. Yeah, certainly, the you know it, it's kind of similar principle, but you know certainly we need to have a proper insulation to avoid or minimize uh, uh, operation losses. Anyway, it's uh, the subject now is under investigation to see whether they would go through this way or to go through uh, uh, transmitting it through one of the derivatives, the e-methanol or the e-ammonia. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Sharif, for this interesting uh, 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 comment and discussion. Um, anyone else has any uh, further questions? Uh, Dr. Kanan, I have a question myself. Uh, sure. uh, I can see that you are doing a lot of uh, 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 things and research in, uh, in, in, in the area of H2. Uh, yes. so can you please let us know what are the latest uh, projects uh, this year that you are working on uh, helping the industry to, uh, uh, to get more mature? Uh, just give us an idea about these uh, projects, please. Okay. So especially on the hydrogen side, uh, we have been uh, working on this uh, hydrogen production methods through photoelectrochemical water uh, splitting. So that's where we, we have a collaboration with a, with a zero avia company. And on the fuel cell side, uh, we want to look at the failure modes for the fuel cell systems with the Nikola Motor Company, because still, I mean, you know, the fuel cell trucks are not very common. So Nikola Motor Company had a lot of issues with the fuel cell failures. 
So that's because, you know, if you look at the investments made in the internal combustion engines all these years, right? So maybe more than 100, uh, 120 years, that's, I don't know how many billions of dollars. That amount of investment has not happened in the hydrogen sector. So our research is mainly in looking at uh, almost not the lab scale, smaller single cell, but it's a, you know, a commercial level multi-cell stack. You know, what happens when uh, probably air gets into an outside when the vehicle is parked. So all these, you know, practical uh, level uh, issues are being looked at in our lab. And for the battery, you know, in fact, uh, I forgot to tell you. So I'm also a chief scientist in a local uh, EV company where we have a project from the company where we look at the thermal management of the battery system. So especially when the batteries are uh, <clears throat> being discharged or even charged, thermal, you know, especially because of the internal resistance, battery temperature goes beyond certain temperature, especially in the summer, right? So our temperature right now is 114 degrees Celsius or Fahrenheit. That's about the probably 46 degrees Celsius. That's ambient temperature in the afternoon. So battery temperature can go probably well above 55 or close to 60. And we want to keep the battery temperature as uh, low as possible. And we need to also pull the power from the same battery to keep the battery cooler. So that means you know available energy for uh, driving becomes lower. So our goal is to actually use a, a passive thermal management system with a phase change material. So our research is again on the thermal management for the batteries in the electric cars. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kalan. Um, yeah, I think uh, we don't have, yeah, we have uh, one more question here. Okay. Uh, what about hydrogen production from seawater, salt water? Is this viable? It is viable, yes. He also asks if it's cost much, if it's costly or something. So the cost again, you know, uh, especially now, so if, you know, based on the Faraday's law, okay, physics principles, you need to actually give almost 40 kilowatt hour electricity, okay, total energy to produce one kilogram hydrogen. So that means if I have uh, electricity available at 10 cents per kilowatt hour, 40 kilowatt hour will cost me $4 per kilowatt hour, okay? So $4 per kilowatt hour is too much to produce. As I showed in one of the slides, the triple one, right? So that one, $1 per kilogram. That means the electricity should come free of cost. Mm -hmm. With a large scale, you know, the electricity production cost has to be much lower. Not 10 cents, not even 3 cents, but it has to be less than a cent, I would say. Because, you know, if I produce more power in my PV-based system, I give it to the utility company, they may only pay me three cents per kilowatt hour. So with the large scale, the energy can be much lower. Like, you know, hydel power system can be like, you know, one, one cent per kilowatt hour. So electricity supply for electrolyzer should be much, much lower than probably one cent per kilowatt hour. Transportation and storage should become very attractive to make hydrogen at a reasonable cost. But at the same time, depending on the source of water, it could be slightly different, but you know, salt water should not be an issue. 